beforehand, we ask that you share your point of views, and uh, we also ask that you share the point of views of our speakers. So make sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the CHLI. Second, we will have a Q&A section after the program, so you can be prepared with any questions that y'all have. And lastly, um, we are live streaming this on YouTube, so if you want to go back and look at the program itself, uh, our YouTube is at the CHLI as well. Now to kick off the program, I'd like to introduce our president and CEO, Marianne gomez Porta. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Um, thank you again for joining. I see some people still standing. We still have some seats here in the front. Uh, and please help yourself to any refreshments. Thank you again. Uh, we, we know that the congressman is, um, is on the way, so as usual, as you all know, you know, here on the Hill, we have, we have a program. We'll give him a little bit of feedback. You should don't need a microphone, but <laughs> um, as you all know, uh, here in Congress, whenever a member comes in, that, uh, so when a member of Congress comes in, we will pause. Um, the program and so as soon as the member comes in no matter where we are in the program we'll just pause and allow the congressman to provide remarks so again buenas tardes thank you everyone for being here um as Gabriel mentioned the Marianne gomez Sota, Chile president and ceo the congressional hispanic leadership institute chile is what we refer to it is a premier organization founded by members of congress to advance the hispanic community's economic progress with a focus on social responsibility and global competitiveness. Founded in 2003, we are the nonprofit that's also the only bicameral, bipartisan, Hispanic led and Hispanic serving organization here in Washington, D.C. We are dedicated to fostering the awareness of the diversity of thought that includes our different heritage, different interests, and different points of view from all Hispanics. Um, across the country and across the nation. I would like to recognize a few people before we start the program. First, for our interns here in person, we have for the first time um, our summer, this is a really bad, we have our summer um, law fellows program. We had started this program a few years ago during the global pandemic and the program was virtual, but now they are here in person. If you can please raise your hands. Thank you very much. If you are someone you know is interested, I don't even have the microphone on. So I'm going to ask uh, Nicole, thank you. Actually, you can have Juan Jose do that if you can stay inside, please, Nicole, to just check. So if, if anyone is interested in being an intern, either Local Leaders Program here in, on the Hill or part of our Summer Law Fellowship Program, um, please speak with Nicole Marin, who is our Senior Internship Manager. Nicole, raise your hand here. That's why you want her to leave the room. He's a special that. Um, the other is we have a couple of other programs coming up, in particular on July 26th. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I'll let check just over that. On July 26th is our Future Leaders Conference that will be uh, back here on the Hill. Uh, in the Cannon Building. So again, it's a morning program for all interns and young professionals. So as I mentioned, if you're here in July, uh, July 26th is our Future Leaders Conference. We always have a very good turnout uh, for that event. Uh, if you're an intern here, a young professional, we have different experts and different people of different backgrounds and different disciplines uh, from across the country giving some insights on how to navigate Washington, um, career path opportunities. Um, so we want to make sure that we see you here again on uh, July 26. Before I introduce the congressman and the panel and the moderator, I um, just want to recognize that this series is sponsored by American Petroleum Institute, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, 
Amazon, Chevron, Accenture, Apple, Charter Communications, Lucenta Square, General Motors, Intuit, and the National Association of Broadcasters. I also want to take the time to thank um, the team for putting this all together, because if I don't, I will forget at the end of the program. So that's why I do it now. So, Gabriel, Angela, Nicole, Tia, Danny, Abeshla, Giovanna, Tyler, Juan Jose, Chris, Sydney, Jasmine, and Anna, thank you very much for your support today. So before I introduce um, our moderator, please uh, give me the opportunity here to introduce um, Congressman Mora. Um, he is, the congressman started, and I, I've, I've added a, a lot of information here for the introduction because this, is about, this, yeah. is, about, this is about higher education, dear, so, so, so come on over while I introduce you. That way you, that way you can correct me on the spot if I say something wrong. So the congressman started his leadership journey at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Thank you very much. Um, then on to the Texas Tech University. He majored in Russian language and area studies and went on to earn an MBA and a law degree. He started in public service in 2005, serving on his local city council of Tyler, Texas. Congressman Moran serves on the Education and Workforce Committee, which is why he's here and we look forward to his remarks. Please join me in a warm welcome to Congressman. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Is it okay let me mic up? Yeah, oh yeah, right. of course. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And as a member of the uh, House Education Committee, I love to talk about education. I've got four kids at home, and we spend all of our time talking about education. You know why? Because education is the key to your future. Education is the key to bring people out of poverty. It's the opportunity to give them the chance to fulfill their call in this life. I, I speak openly about the faith background that I have and how as a young man, when I grew up in a little single wide trailer home on a Bible college campus, my parents, they didn't have two dimes to rub it together, instilled in me the fact that I could treat people with the equal and eternal value that God made them with, and I could work hard day after day, and as I did that, opportunities would present themselves. And education was one of those opportunities. You know, I had to I had to pay my way through uh, through uh, college. I went to West Point for a couple of years, and then transferred to Texas Tech and got three degrees out there. And those times of those years, where I decided to invest in myself, they were crucial opportunity time for me to decide what is my call in life and what am I willing to do to invest in myself so that I can achieve that call, so that I can be a person in this world that is a leader that is a no quit, no excuse leader. That's one of the things I learned at West Point was. The first year at West Point, we had three responses, yes sir, no sir, and no excuse sir. That was it. And there were a lot of times in that, that first year when I had a lot of excuses why things didn't get done, why things were not my responsibility. But you know what I ultimately, ultimately found out was? If I take responsibility for myself and everything else around me that I can put my hands on, even if my job duties don't say it's my job, even if my superior says somebody else is responsible for that, if I made myself responsible for me and everything else around me, I could get somewhere in this life. And I became a no excuse, no quit leader. And that's how you get somewhere because education will give you that, that doorway to open it up. So as a member of the education committee, I'm happy to support things like the expansion of Pell Grants. You know why? Because I was a Pell Grant recipient. I understand how important that is for people to not, that when they look at the daunting dollar figures behind educational opportunities and they say, I, I can't do that. We need to step, in, a step up and make sure that they have that opportunity to do that. We also need to step up, and this is another thing that I've been doing in the education committee, and that is to say, we need transparency in the loan process. Because mm -hmm. Pell Grants only go so far, you guys know that. If you guys have Pell Grants out there, or if you're taking out loans, you know that loans, they can build up real quick. Real fast. You're having to make decisions about what course of study to, to go under. And when I graduated with a Russian degree, I was real shocked when I looked at the fact that there was $16,000 annual salary on average with a Russian degree. Well, you can't pay back a whole lot of loans with a, with a Russian degree. So I had to add to that, build my skill set, build my degrees around that. And that skill set now is playing out in spades here in Congress. But it took 25 years to make itself known. 
but I'm so happy that I got that degree. But I had to look forward and say, all right, how much money am I willing to take out in loans and how much am I going to have to pay back? And that's why we're pushing for more transparency in that process so kids don't get out of college and all of a sudden they realize they got $100,000 or $200,000 of the loans and they're fixing to make $20,000, $25,000, $50,000 a year and they can't even make basic payments back for those loans. We want transparency on the front end of that. Those are two really important things. The third thing that we're working on this, this year for education is we owe a re reauthorization. That's the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act. It gives workforce centers the ability to say, what's the skill set we need in our community and in our businesses, and how do we match that up with education and training so that individuals can reach our potential step by step. You know, sometimes it takes a while to get to where you want to go. Don't be deterred. Stay steady in your, in your life. If you know what your calling is, stay steady. Don't be deterred in the pursuit of that call. Don't do it. People start getting too short, uh, short term in their vision, and they they think, man, when I if I get to 25 and I haven't got my degree, ooh, man, that's 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 too far out. I just can't do it. My mother-in-law went back to school. She was uh, not college educated. Her husband died in her 30s. She went back to school, got her first degree when she was 40 years old. 40 years old. And she's been able to fulfill that call in life since that time. You're never too late to begin that process. I want you to know also that I'm tied to education in a lot of ways, and it means so much to me because uh, my wife is a public educator. My, my brother's a public educator. We've had kids in public school, private school. Uh, my wife's worked at a, at a charter school. Uh, and so we have determined as a family the right path for our kids. And as you raise your families, I'd say you do the same thing. Don't accept the norm. Look at your child and determine what has God put them on this earth for and where is the best educational opportunity for them and help them achieve that. When I was in, uh, I'll reflect back one more story that I, I know you guys need to get on, but I, I love talking about education. And thank you, all four of you guys, for being here today. Also, thanks to Lincoln diaz Bellart for leading this uh, organization and for uh, Mario diaz Bellart and Henry Cuellar for their invitation today. Uh, I really appreciate that. I love working with those individuals. Uh, Henry in particular, another Texan, favorite Texan, one of my favorite Texans uh, of mine. He and I have co-sponsored a bill, and one of the important things I, I did when I got to Congress was decide I want to reach across the aisle. And I reached across the aisle with Henry Cuellar, and we did a bill together, because we found common ground. You've got to do that a lot of times in life. But here's the last story I want to tell you, as it relates in particular to Hispanic education. When I was in, when I was in uh, Lubbock, Texas, I spent four years working at Cavazos Junior High School my first time to ever work in the educational setting. I worked all day during the day and then went to school every evening during the evening. I was a teaching assistant in the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade reading department. If there is a lower person on the rung in education, I don't know who it would be other than the teaching assistant who ran the accelerated reading program at Cavazos Junior High School in that year. It was me. Uh, I sat by myself in the lunchroom. Nobody went really wanted to talk to me because I was a little teaching assistant. And then the next three years after that, I ran after-school programs for those kids through the 21st Century Community Learning Center grant, federal grant program that still is around. I was proud to do that. And in fact, what we did uh, the year of the, of the 2020 election was we offered it out to all 900 students. If you'll complete an elections, electoral process uh, uh, course with me after school, I'll pay for your way to go to the inauguration in January 2021. And we did, but you know what? Only nine students, only nine students out of 900 took me up on that opportunity. But we paid every cent for those students to come and be a part of that 2021 inauguration. And I hope that it's changed their lives. I'd love to go back and talk to them today to find out what impact it made on them. Many have never even been out of the state of Texas. Some never had been out of the county of Lubbock. And we came to Washington, D.C. and stood out here almost 22 years ago now to do that. But they seized that opportunity. They took the responsibility to say, I'm going to show up every day and I'm going to do the coursework and I'm going to complete that. It's our job on this side of the fence as um, agents of the government to make sure that we provide those opportunities. But then on the back side of that, you have to seize them. Don't be afraid in this life to seize the opportunities when they come your way. Seize every educational opportunity you can. Take responsibility for everything around you you can. And I guarantee you, you will achieve the calling you have in this life. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Mark, if you can please, we're just going to take a couple of photos so you can, this is our moderator to join us. Oh, okay. good. Gentlemen, can you please stand? Congressman, please stand.
Thank you all for being here today. So I'm just going to start off by asking all the panelists just to give just a quick, brief intro about yourselves, and then we'll get into the questions part. So I'll start with Kevin. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Lima. I'm the deputy director for the White House Hispanic Initiative. Did I say that shortened version because it's a very long title? Um, I am originally from Los Angeles, California, from Mesita. Uh, my, my mom is from uh, uh, my mom is from Guatemala. So is my dad. And I say this because they here are now. My mom's a housekeeper. My dad's a house painter, and that's what motivated me and inspired me to get into this type of work to serve my community. And so after I graduated with a political science degree, I focused on youth organizing, specifically for brown and black students across the country. And one thing led to another until I was able to join this initiative and be able to you know, bring and advance educational equity and economic opportunities for Hispanics. Good afternoon, buenos dias. My name is Luis Maldonado. I'm the Vice President for Government Relations for the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. We represent about uh, 517 uh, public four-year institutions. Uh, that's the specific sector of higher education. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. Um, my father, the Hibaro, married the hillbilly from West Virginia. <laughs> they actually met in D.C. 65 years ago. Um, my mother was one of the first women ever admitted at Georgetown University. So this city has uh, meant a great deal for us. And I am very fortunate to everybody in my family went to college. I passed that on to my sons. 
So my job now is to help other folks who weren't as lucky as I am to give everyone the opportunity to go to college. Not everybody has to go to college, but everybody should have the opportunity. And that's why I do what I do at ASQ. Hi everyone, my name is David Maestas. I'm from Las Vegas, New Mexico, which is a place. It's not fun Vegas, but it's still it's the original. Uh, it's a small rural town, uh, 15,000 people, predominantly Hispanic. Um, my mom's a teacher, my dad's a funeral director. I definitely did not follow in dad's footsteps. Um, I started off as a teacher for Teach for America back in 2017 when I taught 10th grade English in South Dallas. Um, I really enjoyed the experience, um, but that's where my interest in policy really uh, blossomed, and I've ended up here where I'm now legislative assistant for Congressman Tony Gonzalez of Texas 23rd Congressional District, um, where I help work on his education portfolio and on other issues. Um, I'm still very passionate about education, of course. Um, higher education is what you know, I credit for getting me here, as well as my high school educational experience. So I'm very excited to be here today, and I'm with the rest of you. Good afternoon, everyone. Carlos Becerra with Florida International University, FIU. Miami's Public Research University, proud to be here. My own experience with uh, Hispanic higher education uh, actually begins with my, my overprotective Cuban mother, also a teacher, uh, who kind of told me, you know what, leaving, leaving Miami for, uh, for college, uh, why don't you start at FIU? After a year, you can transfer to where then I want to go. So a little bit, we know when she started, it's 28 years, I still haven't uh, transferred from FIU. Um, <laughs> Uh, experience in Miami at uh, the local K-12 system, uh, Miami Dade uh, Public Schools. Uh, when I've been in this uh, role up here in Washington, serving as the representative for FIU and helping lead advocacy, but also uh, uh, helping build our student programs here. In that regard, I want to give Chile uh, major props and thanks as one of the, our strongest national partners in helping bring uh, some of the young minds up here. I'm also lucky in that, yes, I'm the talking head up here, but it just so happens uh, that today, uh, within this room, we have a great group of uh, FIU faculty, staff members, whether it be from the admissions office, student access and success, our honors college, two engineering faculty that happen to be in DC. And of course, we're going to bring them to this session. So hopefully, some of you uh, get a chance to meet them. But uh, we're excited to uh, expand on this discussion today, not only as FIU, but representing like, so many of our great uh, Hispanic serving urban uh, public research universities. Well, of course, I would be remiss if I don't say if I use a proud member of ASP. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introductions. One thing I really appreciate about the panel is not, not only are they experts in higher ed, but they have lived experiences that really fuel with their work. So just a level set before I ask questions. We're focused on higher ed, particularly the unique experiences that Latino Hispanic students face, and we'll be talking about you know overcoming challenges to plan a college. Once you're in college, how to thrive, and then policies and programs that we can do to ensure folks graduate and end up employing in their careers at uh, high state. So I'm going to start with you, Kevin. In your opinion, what can federal agencies, you know, do in terms of partnerships with um, Hispanic institutions, AKSIs, and communities to ensure that we have policies that support Latino students from K through 12 into college and to graduate? Yeah, well, thank you, Carlos. Uh, so just to give you a little background on the White House Hispanic Initiative, it's an executive order from President Joe Biden to advance educational equity and economic opportunities for Hispanics. And so we're doing that through a couple of mechanisms, but the one that pertains to this question uh, are two of those mechanisms. And one of them is the Presidential Advisory Commission. The, uh, the president appointed 21 leaders private business leaders, HSI leaders, uh, community-based organization leaders, Hispanic leaders that will give him recommendations on what to, on how to tackle these challenges in the, in the Hispanic community. And number two is our uh, federal interagency work group. And essentially the executive order allows us to bring all of the federal agencies and essentially learn from all the agencies what they're doing to advance educational equity and, and economic opportunities for Hispanics. And so we are meeting monthly with multiple federal agencies to learn about how they're 
um, how they're helping out the Hispanic community, what policies they're implementing that help the Hispanic community, and just in general, do a full uh, federal uh, government approach to tackling these issues. And so we also invite members um, of these community-based organizations to speak at these meetings, and we will have our commission also meet with uh, with these organizations. So these are two of, of the ways that, you know, uh, community-based organizations and HSIs can plug into the work that we're doing to advance educational equity. So the next question is to the other fellow, Carlos. Um, I want to talk about FIU. What strategies do you think have worked with FIU? And I just want to say, prepare interns. We've had several uh, interns from y'all's program. We've hired one, got promoted only to manager, so you know we're big fans of FIU. But what have you guys done in terms of like the policy making community and so on and so forth that you think others can learn from FYU? Yeah, and thank you for the question. Once again, FIU is uh, I think where we're at today is a great success story, um, but we're not the only ones in the business. If you look at your uh, uh, minority serving institutions, we're here today mostly focusing on HSIs, but that are in generally large urban areas, generally public, uh, generally supporting populations that are underrepresented minorities, uh, high fellow grants. Uh, the story of our success today goes back, you know, in recent times to 10, 12 years ago. Us not being content with what our four year graduation rates were, our six year graduation rates were. Um, so that story today uh, incorporates a couple of elements. First of all, although everything's focused on student success, and we have many great examples of that uh, today, uh, it started uh, realizing that we needed to invest in faculty success. Mm -hmm. So initiatives on campus uh, uh, and dollars and resources being shifted, and grants being shifted to support uh, our faculty. And that could be uh, in the areas of faculty, uh, course, uh, design or redesign in many cases, making sure that these courses were fresh. Uh, mentorship, uh, making sure that the uh, you know, faculty are connecting to our students. So that's one. Two, a healthy obsession with data. And many of uh, my colleagues that are here uh, with us today could, could vouch for that. Uh, and student data, uh, completion rates. Uh, but some of the most immediate uh, strategies and tactics were uh, these gateway courses. Uh, we started as 17 courses and are still ranked up to 24 key courses in different curriculum tracks that we know were critical to either staying on track uh, on a graduation path uh, or back then producing some show goals. So focusing on those courses, uh, props to the Department of Education and their Title V uh, program because a lot of those uh, grants going back to 2015 helped us rethink uh, algebra and create these models that were very uh, infusing tech, but also not uh, losing fact of, of the human component, uh, and increases in advisors and coaches. So that's produced some results. Uh, college completion micro grants, as we call them. I uh, just got uh, some update today. These are generally about $1,000 micro grants for students that are about within 30 credits of graduation. Our student population, not unlike uh, all of our HSIs, are workers. They're supporting their families. Uh, they're doing their best to stay on track. But what we noticed is that there was a, a good cohort on any given year where we're awarding about two to 300 micro grants to give them a thousand dollars extra if that can ease, you know, make sure that they're registering for the uh, most potential optimum number of courses to stay on track and graduate. The final point I'll leave is we do a lot of blurring of the lines at FIU. Uh, so one of our leaders here uh, helps lead a lot of our student access and success programs, uh, whether that would be a lot of trio or bridge programs, also supported by the department. Um, but when it came to uh, easier uh, on ranks from community college, uh, our local colleges uh, meant for success. So for instance, um, create different pathways where they may be starting, you know, uh, at the local community college, uh, but already part of the FIU community and family. I think that's an important uh, point we'll hear about from all of our panelists. Receiving their Panther ID card, uh, being able to, you know, take part in those activities, uh, uh, knowing that they have mentors there at the community college, 
you know, we're not waiting for them to arrive on our shores. Uh, so those are some some of the elements that today have, have uh, brought our current success. So before I get to the next question, I did want to touch upon micro grants. I think that's something that we're talking about more about, particularly after the pandemic. I can tell you that you know when the pandemic hit, hundreds of thousands of internships and other paid jobs, seasonal like lifeguards, they all got canceled. And you know we had a lot of students reach out to us being like, "Do you guys know what foundation will give us money to like pay rent, fly back home, help out our, our parents?" Right? Which I think a lot of folks sometimes in the policy making world, they and I don't understand that for some students, it's not their parents helping them, it's they're helping their parents, right? They're contributing to the household. So we created a mutual aid fund, and we, you know, we were able to give out money, but we had an applicant from an Ivy League, and their university would not give them a grant. They were in their last semester of their senior year. So that's something that we notice is people will end up dropping out after doing four or five years because they can't pay their last course or both their rent. And so, you know, kudos to FIU. Just, Just to add to that, those grants, it's 95% of the students that received those funds over 3,000 in the last uh, X number of years have graduated now. Maybe. So the next question is for David. We all know that you know, even though we need to increase the rate of Latinos getting four-year degrees, it's not the only pathway to success. So my question to you is, you know, what can Congress do? What kind of policies can they enact to support more alternative pathways like apprenticeships, community college programs, vocational things um, that are not just four-year degrees? So yeah, I mean, I like what you said too about just kind of talking about how four-year degree, um, you know, in some people's mind is the only definition of success. And I think one of the things that is often, that often happens, and a lot of my students thought this when I taught 10th grade, and I used to also mentor freshmen and Mexico State University who all thought that they must go to college, they must receive a degree, a four-year degree, um, that is the only path to a livable wage and, a, and the only path to success. Now, that is true for many people, of course, but it's, it's not true for all. And what I consistently told my students was, there are different paths to success, and it depends on what you want to do, and is it realistic? Um, I think that brings us to the conversation with apprenticeship. You know, we're seeing a lot of students graduate right now with um, large amounts of student debt for programs in which their prospects may not be as good as other graduates who may have less debt. Um, and this is, this is pretty a problem, of course, for folks not being able to pay off their, pay off their student debt or find a job that may allow their interests. Um, some folks go to college, and you know, folks who maybe are in a teaching preparation program, they'll go through three and a half years of teaching, then they'll student teach at the very end in their final semester of college, and they'll realize, oh my gosh, I hate this. <laughs> and this is something my dad happened to my dad, and he became a female director instead. No, that's why I did it. Um, I want, I want to see, you know, I think a lot of us want to see that, us avoid that. We want to see more training in the college, more, you know, on-the-job learning. I think that's something that provides an education. It also helps employers have folks who are willing to come and work for them. And it also allows for potential for people to make money while they're learning at the same time. And this is why apprenticeships have become, uh, you know, come to the forefront of conversations um, for college. You know, folks who may want to take that I think one of the things Congress can do is increase funding for apprenticeships on the federal level um, with appropriate you know, safeguards, of course. You know, we can be sure that we implement something like this in a responsible way. But if we can start kind of changing that narrative and letting people know there's other definitions of success, there's other, if you have interest that will be on for your degree and you can make a living doing that, that's okay. And you know, I think changing that narrative and implementing policies that help you know, increase these opportunities is going to really be something um, that's really going to change the higher education landscape for the better. Oh, and just to add to that too, I think I, I also meant to mention Pell Grants. You know, there's a lot of you know red tape around Pell Grant implementation. You know, we can maybe create a more flexible use of Pell Grants for programs such as approved apprenticeships. Um, that may be something that would also help students from low-income backgrounds primarily, um, you know, find their path to success. I agree with you on the last point. Here's actually legislation. Uh, it was introduced back in 2013 by Rep. Uh, Suzanne Marimichi from Oregon. It would allow students to use part of their power grant for an unpaid internship, which would be life-changing, right? It would be a, a big game changer. So my next question for, is for you, Luis. Um, tell us a little bit more about like, you know, what are one or two 
top policy priorities for your organization, and one or two resources for college students, high students, students, high school, high school students to be involved and know what's going on. So I should have added in my introduction that I actually worked two different times for the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. I was their lobbyist in town. So my, one of my areas of expertise is HSI. One of the reasons I accepted ASU's job was because it now allows me to also work not only with HSI, but HBCUs, and NFPCs, uh, Alaska Native, uh, Hawaiian Native institutions. It expands my portfolio because those, all those institutions have something in common. They are the pathway to the middle class in public four-year institutions for the majority of Americans. The majority of bachelor's degrees earned in this country today come from the schools that are members of ASCU. We have the largest percentage of Pell Grant recipients. We have the largest concentration of students of color, first generation, low income students. So we have a great deal of issues that we care about, but I would summarize them as we care a great deal about access, retention, that is vital for the Hispanic community today. Hispanics are entering college at the same rate as Caucasian students. But we're losing them, particularly in the second year. So retention is a very important part of this process. And third, graduation, success. Those federal policies are some of our priorities. We support doubling Pell to $13,000. We support strengthening the federal-state partnership. How do we leverage? federal policy to incentivize states to invest more in public universities. That is the best strategy to make college accessible and affordable so we don't have to depend on loans. Loans is a reality because we're allowing all of our state legislators to defund public education. That's why you need loans. That's why we hear members of Congress, particularly of a certain age, talk about, I went to college, I went to a Pell Grant, I had a part-time job, I was able to pay for it. That's when Pell covered 85% of tuition. Now it's below 30%. So of course you need a loan to accommodate the remaining part. We want to undo that equation. We want to go back to the other way. Strengthening the federal-state partnership is the best way of doing that. And lastly, one of the common threads that ASCU members have is, this is a really old term. That's going to sound odd, but I'll explain it. They are normal schools. <laughs> Has anyone heard that term before? I'm not sure. Well, unless you're on the panel, Carlos. <laughs> My gray hair. <laughs> My colleague, Kirsten, raised her hand. You don't count either. You know why. Normal schools are schools of education. These are the schools in the 1800s that communities put together to prepare the teachers that would go into the communities to educate folks. Since the 19th century, these institutions have now grown up, become full-fledged colleges and universities. So policy around teachers of education, schools of education are a priority for ASCU. And our priorities now is we need to strengthen them because we are severely underrepresented in terms of the number of teachers in this country, but we need to diversify the teaching board. There's no larger group than the Latino student you can be in your entire 12-year career of K-12 and never see a Latino uh, teacher or Latina teacher. But I also admit the rarest teacher is a black male. We need more black males to become teachers. We need to invest in minority-serving institutions who have schools of education. We need to invest in ASCU schools that every single one has a school of education. That is how we're going to solve that problem. Those are, those are the priorities I would highlight, but I could be here two more hours and not cover anything. Thank you, Luis. You, know, you bring up the teachers, and I was actually in a convening with funders and policymakers and, uh, and policy and lawmakers, 
And you know, we're talking about like, you know, we need more diverse teachers, which is true. And we also just need more teachers just overall. There was 100,000, the shortage was pre-pandemic was 100,000 teachers. Now it's at 200,000 and it's only growing. And I would argue part of the issue is, you know, these rules were written 150 years ago, but it was just women doing the job and, you know, your husband's expected to like subsidize your salary, but teachers are expected when you're in school to do like a year of unpaid work as a practicum in a classroom. Right, like how many people can afford to go to school and then work for free for an entire year? You know, it just, it's not sustainable, right? So I think that's something that policymakers really need to start looking at with honestly art and learn. Right? I'm not saying get rid of the practicum because that's complements of studies, but how can we give more stipends for folks so that they can be focused in the classroom and not on surviving? So I did want to bring that up. Now back to you, Kevin. So knowing that you know, someone with socioeconomic background will impact their educational outcomes, what nonpartisan by policy, uh, policies can we implement to ensure that our community has a quality K-12 education that will prepare them for college? Yeah, so I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways. Uh, and I'm gonna stick to, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to uh, the one that I think is most effective and one that you're seeing implemented in uh, uh, most states across the country. And we have asked for an increased investment in this area, and that's our career pathways uh, investment. And specifically, right now, we have an initiative called Unlocking Career Success which focuses on four pillars. One of them is dual enrollment and making sure that we give students the opportunity to take college credit courses before going into college. Number two, uh, work-based learning, something my colleague David mentioned, uh, you know, regarding internships, apprenticeships. You're kind of leading a big way in that, in that sector. Um, the third one is uh, workforce credentials. <coughs> Something that David also had mentioned, you know, making sure that if we're preparing students before they even have to go to college and they want to, you know, they know that they're going to become mechanics or they're going to be, you know, something that doesn't require that four year education, but still some credentials, that's what we want to focus on. And, and the fourth one, which means a lot to me specifically, is uh, career counseling and navigation. I say that because when I was a student uh, in high school, I had to be the one who was translating to my parents in Spanish all the, uh, all of the applications that I had to do. I was the one, you know, having to translate to them FAFSA and explain to them what FAFSA is. And I never had someone who was guiding me through that that you know entire path of being able to go to college. And so when we talk about you know affordability. You know, one of the things that I feel that is missing is attainability, right? And we have to make it attainable for Latino students to be able to go into college and, you know, receive these workforce credentials, receive um, these apprenticeships, internships, and, you know, we have to make it attainable to them, whether that be also providing this, you know, in Spanish, providing this in other languages so that we can try to uh, make it easier for students to be able to even learn of the opportunities that exist. So those are four of our big pillars of our unlocking career success that I think would tackle this, this issue. And you know, thank you so much for focusing on dual enrollment. I actually did that in high school, where the 2008 economic crash impacted my family, we went into public housing, and in my mind I said, if I can do my junior year in, uh, while I'm in my junior year at the community college, I can graduate early. You know, basically get a full ride and not be a burden to my parents. And my school was like, actually, I don't think you're a good fit. I don't think you'd succeed, you know, succeed or whatever. You push, and I was able to do it, and that saved me money and time. And you know, so kudos to you. So uh, Carlos, obviously, you know, the, the top priority of a university is to educate your students. But in today's economy, you also need to focus on like how do you make sure you know students can be employable. What is FIU doing around that? Like beyond you know, your own walls yeah. and ensuring that you change the careers of students. Well, we're going to start hearing a chorus here because <laughs> a lot of it does revolve around micro-credentials, badges. Uh, earlier today, there was a uh, uh, hearing of uh, the, the Congressman's Committee. Uh, it was titled and framed uh, in the skills-based economy, uh, competencies versus degrees. The framing of it was, um, you know, either or. 
We don't believe that that's equal. Yes, we can, as I pointed out earlier, we can use innovation and we have and we focus on the students to build a better degree, uh, a degree that students are going to graduate on time or at an appropriate time, but not settle for that alone. So the micro credentialing badges uh, with industry, two of our best examples are with uh, ASEA, uh, IT and security management, for instance, or uh, uh, MITRE Corporation based here in uh, Washington with presence all over the country on cyber operations. Uh, our former president tells a story that you know, the best time at any uh, college campus, the graduation commencement ceremony. Uh, after one of his uh, recent commencements, you know, going to the library the next day and seeing some of the graduates, one of the graduates in particular that was there studying for wait a second, did you just graduate? Because no, no, I'm studying for my IT certification. Triggers like, well, why can't we be doing that at the same time? So the micro credentialing is a big thrust. Uh, I'll, uh, just so happens, one of our team members that's uh, here today, so uh, you all want to know more of that. Apprenticeships, 100%. Uh, we, we were one of the first universities in the last, uh, last administration when they opened more towards four-year institutions applying for these uh, apprenticeship dollars. Uh, so that is also in the cyber area, uh, growing area of growth. Um, internships, so that, without a doubt, is, is something that we believe you know, that's a full frontal at the university, whether it be in Miami, here in Washington, D.C. Once again, props to pay, pay our interns. I see so many of you know, our examples here. The FIU student, just like many other urban minority serving institutions that are receiving Pell Grants, cannot come to Washington, D.C. for a transformative experience or an unpaid internship. It's just not gonna happen. So at the university, we have focused, as a lot of us here know, in Washington because of the, the transformative experiences. Those, we collide worlds. We have a, an FIU and DC, uh, DC ready badge, if you will, because we know, as many as Chile knows as well, and CHCI, you know, you just can't start from day one. Students have got a plan, budget, you know, know what their, what their you know, strategy is going to be, who their mentors are going to be. So we make that all into an online uh, module course. But there's other elements. Uh, we going back to the faculty development, uh, helping faculty infuse more writing uh, into these courses, uh, which was, has been somewhat of a shift from the leader top, but you know, students themselves reporting that they didn't feel comfortable in the working world you know, with their writing skills. And so, so those are some elements where uh, you know, we feel good that, and, but once again, you can never stay sad. You've always got to be speaking to the students, hearing what their needs are. Uh, so you can better them. Yeah, yeah it's, I, you know, it's good that for you to taking a more active role because I feel like a lot of universities are very reactive to employment, career outcomes for their students. And I do want to just quickly, federal agencies have this issue where many of them are not paying and saying, you can get college credits or your school can pay for you. That is an issue because not every school is Harvard that can provide you know, their student $5,000. So that's just something where it's like, everyone should pay their own interns. <laughs> For you, David, can you mention one or two policies that you think would ensure more success for Hispanic students? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's what's um, difficult for a lot of students is a lot of them know, and you know, something that I went through is you know, prior to college. Uh, for those who are first generation um, or you know, from different backgrounds, it's difficult to understand how one's going to navigate college, how am I going to pick a major, how is somebody going to find folks. Um, when they get to college, we're going to navigate them through their finances, through career counseling, and it was mentioned up here, someone mentioned counseling uh, for students, you know, career counseling. And, um, one of the policies in place is, is uh, federal TRIO programs. Federal TRIO programs, um, you know, I believe they receive about a billion, one billion a year. Um, don't quote me on that, but, you know, they do receive a a little over really that's right about yeah that's right um you know they they, they they contain seven programs two of which i think are important one is um, upper bound so this is primarily for low income first generation students um you know i'm one of those who grew up in the low income background who benefit from upper bound um, this is a program that helped prepare me or, you know a lot of my colleagues and i for college it provided math and science centers uh, to help us prep for college we know that math and science right now is, is lacking nationwide and that includes among Hispanic students. Um, so I think 
you know, you're giving exposure to students in high school, college concepts, college courses, and telling prep young people what to expect. Open Brown does a fantastic job of that. Another program um, within tr the trio programs that's very beneficial is student support services. So when students go back to college, you know, these services provide a range of a range of activities such as tutoring, course selection advice, and courses on financial literacy. I think this is really important. When I was um, you know, advising college freshmen, a lot of them thought, once I decide my major, that's it. I have decided my major, I'm going to be a, you know, I'm gonna be in business the rest of my life if I chose business. If I chose government, I'm gonna be in government the rest of my life. But that's something that's not true, as a lot of people here know. And, um, you know, the program that I was working for, you know, we were funded through an initiative that I was working to help the students understand that when you're not getting college, there are a lot more opportunities available to you than you think, um, just because you know, you're not limiting yourself to one career path because you chose this one major. That's a very limiting mindset for students, I think, and if we can provide resources to the programs such as TRIO, I think that's huge. Um, another one to mention is, of course, the, somebody mentioned that mentioned the NSI's, you know, HSI program, if the university has at least 25% Hispanic student population, there are there is additional funding from the federal government available. I think that is something that is crucial uh, to Hispanic student success. And I think last is the HSI STEM and articulation programs. Again, STEM is very important. We need to see um, you know more success with STEM and these HSI programs that are focusing on STEM, I think really help your Hispanic students know success in those fields. And we're allowed for more representation in those fields as well. Awesome. We're gonna do a couple more questions and then we'll take some questions from the audience. So you know, write down if you have any questions. Uh, and kudos to Upper Bound, also benefit, you know, beneficiary of the program. One thing we often talk about is how daunting it can be to apply to colleges, particularly your first generation college student, come from an immigrant family. Uh, you know, I always tell people, like, sometimes your parents, of course, want to support you, but if they have not gone to college, take their advice with a grain of salt. Because oftentimes, people don't go to the right school because they're, you know, if you're like Latina, you're, the dad says, oh, Ros, we lejos, you can't go there, right? Like, that should not be the, de the deciding factor of where you go to school. Uh, so, I didn't want to add that. Kevin, what policies can we do to ensure that Latino students have more access to scholarships and other forms of financial aid that aren't always the most. Yeah, for sure. And that, I mean, uh, Reese really hit it on the nail with double of help, uh, or just increasing the Pell Grant. Um, something that we asked for in our budget um, to Congress. But, you know, doubling the Pell is, uh, that number that you said, of, what, 13,000 is, I mean, that, that would change so many people's lives and make it so much more affordable to go to school on top of the fact that then that will lead to, you know, just economic mobility for, for students and graduates uh, to pursue the jobs that they're interested in doing. Um, another one which is, uh, you know, I have mentioned in my previous answer about attainability. We, have, we were just at the Common App conference. Maybe some of you guys used Common App and talking about attainability, they on their application have now made it easier to know what uh, what uh, what are some of the uh, ways you can qualify for financial aid and what are you automatically qualified for. And the Common App made that easier so that when students are applying, they don't have to be worried about, uh, am I eligible, am I not eligible? It's already automatic for them. They can see that immediately and read it. And just those little changes like that, where it can make it more attainable for a student who's already scared of the process. So a student who, you know, like me, who was translating to their parents, and I, I have no idea if I'm, you know, if I can afford this or not. And just those little things that make it more attainable, I, I think is something that, you know, um, we can focus on. Carlos, can you tell us just a little bit more about uh, the newly announced Alliance of Hispanic Serving Research Universities? Sure, and I, we'd love some information out of uh, a science desk if you want more. Um, in the spirit of uh, wanting to use a certain set of schools as, as good labs for a lot of these issues we've discussed, uh, and knowing that 
the education community. We're all going about it. Thankfully, we all ask you exist, who exists. Uh, but uh, a little over two plus years ago, uh, what are 21 institutions today that are uh, Carnegie Research One, so doing high research. And I'll come back to why that's important, especially when you look at uh, funding for students. Um, Hispanic serving institutions. Um, that uh, that subset of schools is about uh, 21 now. So we go by uh, uh, Hispanic, the Alliance of Hispanic Serving Research Universities. The research question uh, is critical because if we're looking at the uh, creating more uh, pathways for professors and uh, professoriate at these institutions, uh, that pathway is through graduate degrees, research funding, and uh, uh, you know, stipends and opportunities possible. But just to take a look at those 21 institutions, total enrollment nationwide of those 21 are about uh, 780,000 students. Uh, they produce about 190,000 graduates a year. So these are scale issues too. I mean, we see this as a, as a good potential lab for the federal government for uh, policymakers. Uh, just under 40% are receiving Pell Grants. At FIU, that number is a little bit higher. 55% of our FIU student, undergrad students are receiving Pell Grants. Uh, so if you, and if you look at the total, about 30, 30 some percent of all those students are Hispanic. Yet, only 9% are uh, Hispanic faculty. And I'm sure the numbers track, as we already mentioned, the black faculty. Um, so we have banded together. We have some key congressional aspects as question what policies can we make. So we've been working with our, our various delegation members to try to uh, plus up some appropriations to achieve a few goals. Double the number of Hispanic doctoral students uh, across uh, in the country so that uh, we can also increase by 20% the Hispanic professor uh, Because there is an issue, uh, without a doubt. If we, if we get to the grain of uh, why we assemble today is you know, what are the needs of the Hispanic uh, students and the uh, underrepresented minority students. We saw it in STEM education, where uh, a great story at FIU. Today, we're pleased with what we've done to transform STEM education. Uh, introductory courses for those of you that are that are closer closer to your introductory courses in physics and biology, um, creating smaller learning environments, uh, getting more junior and senior students to to co uh, to be learning assistants. Um, that produced a lot of, has produced a lot of good dividends because although the professors may not yet look sound uh, uh, like you know our large Hispanic and black population, nevertheless those fellow students uh, are breaking some barriers and are, are producing some, some good, uh, uh, good success in those introductory courses. So that's the alliance of Hispanic serving research universities. We're doing a lot of new focus on uh, women in STEM as well. Uh, but we're trying to drive the, uh, the federal government to use these institutions uh, as, a, as, a key, uh, as a key testing ground for a lot of these studies. So this question is for you, Louise. It's the last particular question for our panelists, specific people. So any day now, we will be hearing from the Supreme Court on the Harvard University and USC Chapel Hill affirmative action case. What do you think is going to happen? And how can this, how will this impact the team of students in college? Well, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not joking. I think that is the most important question that has been asked today. We don't know what the effects will be because we haven't seen the final decision. The final decision can go in many different directions. But we know for certain that it's going to limit opportunity. It's going to result in less students of color going to the most highly selected institutions in this country. That's a fact. Whatever inroads we were making, black students, Hispanic students, Asian students, we're going to lose that path. There won't be other institutions. You know, community colleges are open access schools. Our institutions are moderate access. You have to qualify to get in, but their acceptance rate is very high. We are there to serve communities. The more selective ones, and I don't need to name them, we don't know who they are, are not going to be able to admit. And it's very important that we say something about the Asian students also. Because 
it's Asian students who are bringing up this suit, these suits. But we think of Asians as one group, and that is wrong. It, they, there's great diversity, and it's just a few years ago, a handful of years ago, that the federal government started actually counting the different members of Asian of the Asian groups. There's a great difference, and I'm generalizing here, I'm admitting it. There's a great difference if you're from China, Japan, or Korea, than if you're from the Philippines, Burma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we need to acknowledge, because those are the facts, if some Asian students are bringing the suit, but it doesn't mean that all Asians are going to get into those highly selective schools, because many other Asian students will not get into those schools. So the impact of that is going to be sad for our country. It's going to limit our economic development. We're going to have to continue to import many of the professionals that we need to drive our high tech and others. These are the institutions are generating many of the engineers that are innovative. Doesn't mean that you can't come from a community college. Doesn't mean you can't come from one of our schools and not be highly successful. So I fear about that. I also wonder the specifics of the decision, whether that's going to, in the future, create a challenge for HSI funding, and a PC funding. This is funding directed because of the uh, race or ethnicity of a group of students. Based on the details of the decision, we're also afraid that this is going to prohibit colleges and universities from creating summer enrichment programs for Latinos to enter STEM programs, black students enrichment programs. We are concerned that those things will have to stop, but I'm praying for in the details of the decision that we need to adjust them, but still manage to be successful. But until we see the details, we don't know. So the not knowing is what fills us with fear. But if we take the Dobbs decision as one example of the major alteration of what we at least understand our reality to be, the implications of eliminating race as one of the many considerations in the admissions process could reverberate into our society for decades to come, and we don't know the outcome of that. So today, I'm afraid particularly for our community, and all students of color. Thank you. So, these last two questions for anyone in the, the panel. What policies or programs would you support to help alleviate the student debt crisis for low-income students, those of working class backgrounds, while also balancing that you know, we need to make sure the higher ed financing remains stable? Well, uh, one of those other decisions that's also going to come out right after the affirmative action case is also the student loan debt cancellation case that we're also waiting to hear back. And I think that's one of those things that we try to implement where, you know, we would remove the president would want to remove 10K through 20K of student uh, loan debt. One out of two Latinos would get their entire debt removed. Imagine not having any debt and being able to now focus on building a family, buying a home, starting a business, things that are you know, part of the American dream that unfortunately, because of the high cost of going to school, have now limited all of our Hispanic community and black communities much more than you know, other, other uh, affinity groups. So, uh, that's one of the ways that you know this administration is tackling that question. And the second one is also with making community colleges free, making affordable community colleges, working with states to make community colleges, uh, you know, that get that associate's degree free is something that we're also tackling. And you know, it's in that budget that we also submitted to Congress where we have increased uh, and we're calling for a new grant to make it free to go to a community college. Before anyone answers that, y'all can address this part. And I will say, I personally would have benefited 
from 20K being wiped off. But that doesn't solve what's going to happen in 5, 10 years, right? Because we're just going to end up where we started because of killing the student debt. So if anyone can tackle that, that would be great. So um, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, when it comes down to, you know, what's leading to this problem in the first place, right? Because student loans, I mean, that increases accessibility for college for so many students. We can't just get rid of student loans altogether. It's something that has benefited many folks, including myself. Um, but I mean, we need to look at certain aspects of this, this student loan um, discussion here, such as universities raising their tuition. I mean, university tuition has skyrocketed over the last several decades. And when a students, when student loans are, you know, made to a university, they get that money immediately. The university gets that money, and then after that, you know, the, the servicer um, is left to ask the student, hey, you can pay this back. So I mean, universities are they're just fine, right? I and mean, we need to look at the way in which we can, you know, regulate this, you know, maybe not regulate, but find some way to encourage universities to keep their tuition manageable for students to keep student loans manageable for students as well. Um, I think borrowers also, one of the ideas that I heard that was I thought was very interesting is borrowers will take out loans every semester until they graduate, and they will have no idea of what their cumulative balance is. They will, they will not see their cumulative balance of student loans until the day that they get that envelope um, from their servicer that says, you owe 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars or more. So, you know, I think notifying borrowers periodically, you know, maybe every time you take out a loan every semester, just notify them. This is how much you currently have taken out. If you take out this amount, this is going to be your new balance. This is going to be what your payments are going to look like in the future with this balance. You know, creating a process to better inform borrowers and notify them every time they take out a loan of where they stand on their on their, their loans to make them say, hey, if they don't need this extra amount, hey, is this going to be worth it? Um, and I think showing students the average return on investment for their chosen career path. So if a student knows they're going to go into a career field that, that on average earns a certain amount, you know, that maybe it'll help them make better decisions in terms of how much they need to take out uh, with student loans. Because we are some folks that are you know, going into fields that don't necessarily offer a large return on investment, and they're stuck with six figures to the loan debt, right? Or to the loan debt in the 40s, 50 thousands. So better informed borrowers, I think, is one of the solutions here, um, in addition to figuring out how universities can keep tuition manageable. And I'll just add, uh, echo those uh, comments nationwide, I think we all have the challenges. I'm from Florida, and I know that means a lot of things to a lot of people. <laughs> um, although our housing experts will tell us, you know, some of our cities are the most unaffordable currently, you gotta look at the total cost of education. But on your tuition point, there is something to be learned from the state of Florida state universities, these 12 institutions, the highest in quality, have kept tuition uh, over the three past uh, current uh, two previous uh, records. Tuition flat, we had to tighten belts, we think so. There, there is some lessons to be learned from the Florida uh, public university model. That being said, you know, the economy is the economy, and, and Miami is, is, uh, is unfortunately an example. You know, you've got to take a look at that total cost of, uh, of uh, attending college. Uh, but, so, David, I, I would say that the federal state partnership is the best way of addressing that because. Institutions raise their tuition because they can't get the money that they need to service and maintain the institution. One of the things, for example, that got removed from the infrastructure bill that the previous Congress approved was a significant investment in colleges and universities. The average building in colleges and universities today was built in the 1950s. So, Tell, just think about the investment that the campuses have to do in keeping the building going, structurally sound, wired with the modern technology, the retrofitting, how expensive that is, heating and cooling, depending on what part of the country you're in. That's just one thing of facilities in terms of the cost. States are not investing in our institutions. They're passing the burden to students and families. And somehow, collectively, this is my personal opinion, not ask you, somehow, 
we collectively do not look at the ballot box and say, did our elected official, and this is not a partisan statement because it happens in Democratic states and Republican states, are they actually representing me correctly? Are they making the investments that we need? When it comes to higher ed, the answer is no. That is why you and all of your other students and the students who are coming tomorrow and the one next week will have to get loans because as a nation, we're not investing. Ask who's asking Congress. Let's leverage your power, your influence to tell states, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you a dollar back. Let's invest directly in the thing that will make college more affordable, public education. It doesn't have to be free, that's a whole different part of the conversation, uh, but it needs to be affordable and accessible. I should also want to add something about adult learners. We haven't talked about that. I mentioned about how Latinos today are enrolling at the same rate as white students, but there's a whole slew of, maybe not my parents, but many other parents, who never had a chance to go to college. Let's help them. It could be a certificate, it could be an associate's degree, it could be a bachelor's degree, it could be a short-term training program. We have a need to educate our adult learners too. Aspen Institution is the largest recipient of non-traditional students. So if you are a graduate from high school at 18 or 19 and you think you go directly to college, that makes you a non-traditional student. You go to school part-time, you're a parent, uh, you're already working full-time, part-time, whatever. All of those other permutations, they come to our school. We need to better support them as well. So, so this is the last question, and then we'll go to the audience for questions. Talking about non-traditional learners, students in our communities are more likely to be cashiers, servers, while in school, you know, just to pay for expenses at the detriment of not being able to intern. What can the federal government or colleges do to ensure that more students, particularly Latino students, can be able to intern and gain critical skills for employment? They should look for programs. Uh, the college scorecard, something that has been in place a number of years now and continues to improve. The college scorecard is one way of gaining additional information, but we need to help our students in high school better understand how you find information about colleges. What are the programs? What are the requirements? What are the opportunities? Many of our institutions are built, they build their programs, their courses with that in mind. Some programs are better than others in starting those opportunities, but there's no, there's no other way around it. We're doing some, but it's not nearly enough because being able to show students that they belong, that they actually can succeed if they stick it out, and if they actually have the experience where they're being trained, educated to do that work, they can prove to themselves, I can do this, I can be successful, I will be happy. So I, I think we need to do a better job of doing that, for sure. I think there are some great examples out there, but the key is to help students find those programs so they can align what their plans want to be. I'll add to the mix, uh, we've got a few years now, uh, great uh, starts with the federal government uh, you know, going beyond the Department of Education, so the NSF, or the uh, Department of Commerce. A lot of uh, focus on these regional opportunities, with the regional hubs, and set aside uh, Department of Commerce, their smart, smart uh, growth jobs. We had in Miami, the Miami uh, Tech Hub, uh, led by the college, we uh, used a part of it. This is married. One of the needs of the of the uh, uh, population from a human capital perspective, the needs of industry in this case, these you know high tech growth sectors, where can folks like Miami Dade, FIU, other players make that fill that gap uh, that you were just describing. So the fact that some of these federal programs are looking at you know what are these large metropolitan areas, how can we you know accelerate some some innovation there? I think is a good thing. Hopefully that. Awesome. So now we're going to go to the audience. 
If you can just raise your hand, uh, a team member will come to you. Make sure just to say your name, you know, where you're working or actually in that. And please make sure it's a question, not a comment. So, uh, you go first. Good afternoon, Ms. Pino. My name is Melanie Diaz Rubos. I actually do at FIU where I'm doing my master's in English literature. I'm um, Afro Latina uh, authors and I'm doing a bachelor uh, at FIU literature pre law. My question um, it's a little long, but it's very important. Um, many of you have mentioned initiatives like apprenticeships, micro grants, many credentials as a means to power and base more students. A potential area of growth that we haven't really discussed yet, but I felt with firsthand as a first generation student, is standardized testing. So whether it's a certification at a trade school, an LSAT prep course, or GREs testing, um, the cost of testing and test prep can really stand in the way of many otherwise qualified candidates. And that being said, what efforts have been made in your institutions, organizations, to look into this matter, especially considering how many of these tests help secure careers along with academic success? Who wants to say that? <laughs> I'll take the first step and say yeah, specific strategies. I don't know today, but you know, I can find out. Uh, did, you, did you have any experience yourself? Or? Well, I just know for myself, a lot of the cost of um, LSATs was one of the reasons why I decided to push back on law school. And I know so even my brother who goes to trade school sometimes, you know, dealing with that has kind of stunted his ability to move on to the next part of his education. So the thing I would share with you is. Those are private companies. They decide what they're going to do, how much they're going to charge. Uh, my understanding is that they do have programs for low-income students to either reduce or avoid the cost altogether. But if the student is not aware of that, that's a missed opportunity. The other thing I will add is the result of the pandemic, one of the effects of the pandemic is increasingly more universities are deciding not to use testing as part of the admissions process. So that is gaining a lot of interest and steam, uh, particularly among the highly selective institutions. Because that's, you know, I have to admit, that that's mostly related to the fact that less students went to college during the pandemic. And we know that 2026 is the big cliff you haven't heard that term, you're going to hear it very soon. Because of the recession in 2008 and 9, people stopped having babies. Come 2026, the number of high school graduates is going to start to go down drastically. We lost a lot of people in the recession, meaning people that weren't born. Uh, because people were afraid of the economic situation and they stopped having babies. So that is a big threat to all academic programs, from certificate programs to doctoral programs. There's less people in the pipeline. So that's another reason why they're doing away with standardized testing for the purposes of admission. Okay. Hi, I have a question for uh, Lewis. So my name is Alex Chavez, I'm a Chevy, um, one of the law fellows. Um, I know we talked a lot about, um, we mentioned that second year um, Spanish students were dropping off, and we had a little bit of conversation about like, finances being an issue, but are there any other factors leading to that drop off, and are they being addressed? So um, there are many issues. We can't point to one thing, but commonalities in, in our best understanding of it. On average, Hispanic students are loan-averse. Hispanic families are loan-averse. We rather work one job, two jobs, three jobs in order to make the money to pay for that, for that credit hour. That forces us more, on average, to go to school part-time. That means we have to work longer to make more money to pay for a longer period of school. And as I like to describe it, life happens in that period. You fall in love, you get married, you have a child, you get sick, your mother gets sick, you lose your job. I mean, life happens. That is one of the biggest challenges we face with Latino students is retention. I'm not going to give colleges, universities, not just us, 
every college university every class and say, we can do better in course scheduling, uh, forcing professors to actually teach as opposed to just only uh, do research or write papers. There's some things we can do at the institutional side, but mostly it's, it's something about life getting in the way because they're not taking advantage of dual credit programs while they're in high school. Uh, they're not applying for Pell Grants. They're not completing the FAFSA. African American and Hispanic students are the largest groups who do not fill out the FAFSA. They don't get a Pell as a result of that. They're not exposed to a loan, work study, SEOG grant funding, and all the different programs that are available to <coughs> student fund their education. Those are all challenges related to your question. Thank you. Just one last thing I would add is, because Latino students are more likely working part-time jobs because we don't take out too many student loans, there's actually studies that show the GPA in academics also drop, which, you know, impacts people helping out. I just wanted to add, I had a work full-time undergrad, and my GPA did drop because I was missing class. Mm -hmm. I do left from the University of Florida. My attendance was 70% of our grade, so I would often miss. Of course, Hispanics are not the only ones, but since we are the largest group of students of color, we have a larger proportion of impact. Go ahead. Well, hello, my name is Jose Molinelli. I'm from San Juan Puerto Rico. I'm currently a law student and I'm a Chile law fellow in the summer. And I have both the benefit and the curse of while well, being a part-time student, also being a college adjunct professor at the same time. So I get to see a little bit both sides of the spectrum in, in a very masochistic way, I might say. And one thing that has always intrigued me is dropout rates, naturally, and the reason why they occur, specifically when students give you feedback saying that I would love to stay, and of course, that unfortunately, don't have that means to. So I know that the Center for the National Center for Education Statistics in 2010 recorded that Hispanics had a 16% dropout rate at the time, and in 2020 it was reported that they moved down to 7%. And in your experience, I'd like to ask which strategies or policies or frameworks maybe might have been implemented in this time that might be something that we need to continue in 2020, in 10 years. Can we give just a few more responses? At FIU, I know we made a, a serious investment in advisors across the disciplines. One, technology, believe it or not. Uh, just one quick example, uh, a student that probably might have missed uh, 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 not scored well on two repeated tests. Some advisor would be notified, they'd reach out. So it was both high tech, but also high touch because we ran with a number of advisors in our case. I'll make it quick too. I'm forgetting and I'm trying to look for my notes, but I'm the, one of the things that this administration is also focused on is making sure that we're tackling the things that are also happening outside of school, such as providing food, things that will make students not pay attention in school, right? Things that will make them cause, cause them to drop out of school. So I, I forgot the name of the initiative, uh, but I. There was a pamphlets that were passed out um, with some resources and the websites to our uh, the department, and you can find on the department it's something along. I'm forgetting what the, the name is, but I'll, I'll remember and I'll come find you, and I'll uh, I'll make sure that I can direct you to what we're doing to tackle the outside of school problems that lead to dropouts inside of school um, that we're working on right now in the Department of Education. Uh, yeah, my name is Jerry Fish, this is just Mary Das. But I guess I'm curious, with regards to workforce development, uh, we all know that the underrepresented groups are still what it is today, it's one, two, and three. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm a hustler, so I'm thinking to myself, if you tell me school is free and there's a pathway, pipeline, bridge, trio, doctorate, it's free, cool. Most people would go that path, but the reality is there's certain Prerequisites and competencies that you have to build over time to get to that testing. Cool. Fast forward, you build these IT paths, certain certs, don't necessarily need a four year degree narrative. So, my question becomes in the Hispanic ecosystem, 
what is the freshman's at critical mass majoring if they're not going the IT path and more than that? They are, in fact, enrolling, thinking, and wanting to be part of that path. It's when they start hitting uh, statistics or advanced algebra, that's when they hit the wall. That's when they realize that their high school failed them. That's when they realize, well, they don't actually realize it in most cases, but that's when they learn that their school district was underfunded. Because there's great disparities across this country in how school districts get funded and the uh, teachers that they have access to. Who are the best trained teachers? The investments that we make in schools of education to incentivize students to become teachers and actually go to that district and get um, loan forgiveness for the fact that they taught for uh, uh, a high need topic like math or science in a school district that needs well-trained teachers. So I would say, in my experience, funding is one issue. Uh, it's also my experience that they want to join those careers, but they're not academically prepared to do it. And I think institutions, all institutions, can do a better job of help supporting them, and there are strategies out there to help those students realize they're not prepared and then do something to help them prepare so that motivation to enter a STEM field can actually become a reality. And because we're underrepresented in those fields, the up-and-comer young generation cannot look up and see themselves as an example. That is, the, in my opinion, that is the biggest obstacle. We got, we're not there to inspire them because we haven't had enough people achieve that goal in representation of the size of the population. And just to add to that too, I mean, we need to understand how important it is to tailor to the student. We can't be teaching students, uh, for instance, one size fits all approach. I'm not sure you know, I've heard that phrase many times, right? I mean, you know, we can't be turning out students like schools or factories. We need to, um, you know, invest in innovative learning models for students. We have to look at each student. How does this specific student learn? What strategies work best for them to make sense of the concept? And that's where you see a lot of talk these days about innovative learning models um, that drift away from just traditional public schooling. You see the increase in public charter schools. You see an increase in um, vouchers. You see any of them. And we can talk about all these different, these different options. But there needs to be a way to provide innovation, hold these innovative models accountable, and tailor to the needs of the student. Another, another way we can do that too is you have to be very careful with standardized testing. We know standardized testing helps us see kind of the level of, you know, does everybody a level playing field to see where they are? But if these students learn in different ways and teachers are spending their entire school years teaching to one single test that is just rigid in its design, it's going to be very difficult to have to reach those students that need a different approach uh, to learning. And it's not always going to be the most accurate measurement for that student's knowledge. There are students who are much more knowledgeable than their test scores you know, seem to portray. And we need to be innovative in how we implement testing to students as well um, to help them feel confident and to help them understand these, these skills and competencies that they need to succeed post-secondary uh, education. And I'll rip off of uh, Lisa's answer. Uh, once again, the Miami uh, U story. Uh, yes, large schools in terms of scale. And that's why I continue to point out not everyone lives in a major city. And we've got to address the needs of the world community. Well, but uh, the expanding the aperture at FIU it was blurring lines. If they were passing the college algebra course, yes, there's things we could do at FIU. But in Miami Dade County and Broward County, FIU produces 40% of the teaching workforce that are in the public schools. So we changed our perspective and said that's all, that's on us as well. It's a good uh, teaching uh, course that's in public schools aren't. You know, where they need to be as well, we're producing them. So we touched on college of education being important that need and needs to be a big priority, 100 percent Because of that fact, if the if the STEM, if the uh, teacher in that STEM course uh, or whatever course in uh, K-12 is not inspired, it's not motivating, it's not reflective of the population, you know, where are they being trained at our nation's colleges? And I think that, that we're learning, we're still learning about the strategies that are working. The Department of Education over the years has 
funded these experiments. Public, uh, private foundations have done so too. And uh, some, of the, some of the strategies relate to uh, trying to avoid at all costs. Um, sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Um, the courses you have to take on college when you fail, of course. Uh, remedial education. We need to do away with that. We use it now because the students are arriving, we realize they're not quite prepared. Schools are using different strategies. Okay, we realize you're struggling. Let's intervene while you're actually remaining in the class. When we remove you from that class, that's the, the first wrong signal we're, sell, we're telling you. So we colleges are learning. Let's intervene immediately. Uh, weekly check-ins by a faculty member. Peer-to-peer -peer learning. Let's identify students, upperclassmen, who are successful in those courses that can support that individual through those basic blocking courses. Uh, tutoring, immediate hand-to-hand -to -hand tutoring as the course develops, as opposed to removing them from the program, trying to give them remedial education, and we lose a lot of them. So institutions are learning strategies that are working, using email, using texts on phones, sending them a weekly reminder, hey, you know, have a great week, remember to show up in class, you can do it. These small things we're learning have great impact and encourage them to stay and do the hard work to stay in the program while they're also being supported to be successful. Can you give us yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, one of those organizations that tackled that question and they're going to release a report in the next three months is called the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and they have tracked that question with their uh, cohort of uh, professional engineers and asked them that question of what kept you in, you know, in school and what kept you motivated and during college and, and they are going to release a report that tackles some of those questions so i would highly recommend you you know follow um, follow them and just keep track of uh of that report because they're going to go deep into that's that question that you're asking i just don't want to be ignorant to consume the hispanic community or the african American community or any minority community wants to be a scientist and engineer that's the question i'm curious what does the average Gen Z student is interested in wanting to do and not necessarily be? And if you'd like, we could talk about that in reception time. We are at time, so please help me. Clap for everyone, for all the panelists. I'm curious from a show of hands. How many have the, how many of us have student loans? I still have. Yeah, I still I think I think I've been paying them all. How many had work study? How many had an internship? How many had a paid internship? See the hands there was less hands. So all the hands that were raised, and I think at some point everybody raised at least once. And, and this is what I always say at the end, is that you have had the opportunity to be in this room, here in Congress, to hear this conversation, to learn about the policies, to learn about what's going on, to learn about what hasn't worked, what are some areas of opportunity. And so it's now upon all of us, including you, whether you raised your hand or not, to contribute. And so part of it is that what are you going to do now with this information? Who are you going to help? There was always somebody that helped us in some way or manner, of, of, whether it was $20 a loan, emergency or something, or helping us with homework, whatever it might be. We did not get here alone by accident. So what are you going to do to help the next person, to help somebody else who's back at home or on the campus? If you're a student here and you're going back to school, Think about that and how you're going to contribute. The other thing that we need is we need more Latinos to become school board members. We need you to be in the policy making side of it as well as the academic side of it. Um, and with that, I'm going to close and say thank you very much for being here and we look forward to seeing you at the Future Leaders Conference on July 26th. Have a wonderful summer.